I mean, just thank God for his move here so far tonight. And uh, we also uh, thank God for uh, the word that he's going to speak. We thank God also for you all that are here present with us, those that are listening and maybe watching. Again, we don't take that for granted, you know. And I don't say that just to be saying it. Uh, we really don't take it for granted. We're, we're thankful. We know that you all could have gone somewhere else to listen or could have uh, been doing something else with your time. And so my prayer is, is that if you honored the Lord uh, to come and hear what he has to say, then you will expect him to be saying something to you, that you will expect him to speak something that will help you to, to grow in him. And so we're just thankful for that. Amen. So I'm thankful for my wife, who is a blessing uh, to be able to stand on side of her and minister the word of the Lord uh, with her. It's, that's a blessing. It really is. There was a time when I was married before, and then I was single again, and divorced, and I would see uh, preachers up preaching, and I would wonder if they under if they knew how blessed they were to have a, a wife that was there to support them and to be sitting there uh, and to be with them. And so <clears throat> I don't take my wife for granted and I thank the Lord for her spirit and uh, that the Lord uses her in the manner that he uh, uses her. I'm, I'm thankful for her. Thankful for everyone as well that's uh, here. You know, and my prayer is that uh, if you if you're listening in that you will Ask the Lord what is it that he would have you to do in this life for him, you see. Amen. Not just as a part of this ministry or whatever, but what would God have you to do for him? If God allowed you to be born, then he has a purpose for you, Amen. you see. He has a purpose for you. So let's, let's my prayer is that you'll find that purpose. All right, I, I feel led. We're going to move out of the way just for a second. I'll just push to the side and let Taylor come up and tell her testimony. I mean, you don't have to take your mic off. We're not going anywhere. We're just, <laughs> just, <laughs> we're just going. Come on, come on around. Okay, everybody. This is Taylor, our second to the youngest daughter. I want to thank God and um, give him all respect. Um, well, earlier this week, um, I was blessed with a scholarship, a four-year scholarship to TSU with um, everything free besides books but <laughs> but um we know that it's only God that did this had nothing to do with my grades my um and what I did because I was doing what I was supposed to but God gave me this because this could this scholarship could have went to, to anybody anybody with over a 21 on the ACT with a GPA that reached their standards. Um, my advisory teacher just happened to be in the office with the man from TSU, and there the man from TSU was like, we need somebody with the ACT score over 21, this type of GPA making these type of grades. Um, and my advisory teacher out of all his students chose me and called me out of the office. They called me out and um, congratulated me on that. Something I didn't have anything to do with, and I don't believe that's a coincidence at all, that my advisory teacher just happened to be there, that my advisory teacher and I just had that relationship, and he knew that I wanted to go to TSU. You know, that's not a coincidence, and that's not based on my grades and whatnot, but based on because God wants me to be down here and if it's his will then he's going to provide ways in order for that to happen. Um, I thank God for him using the people he's used for that to happen. I don't know where they are spiritually but God, God can use anybody he wants to. Um, I thank God for everything that he has done and will do. Um, when I told my friends um, about my scholarship. The real friends were happy, but the other ones wouldn't even let me use their cell phone to um, call my parents and let them know. 
and will make excuses for me not to. So, you know, when things are God's will, those who are the closest to you or who you think are close to you for your reasons, they might let you down, but nevertheless, God's will is God's will. And I thank him for that scholarship. That's what I do. Um, I thank him for being down here because he didn't have to give me another chance because I've been down here before and rebelled against his will. And he let me see that and then reap the blessings for doing what I was supposed to do and letting, and I thank God for those people he used. Amen. 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 Stay right here, man. I told you we're going to sing a song to you. Oh, God. You know. <laughs> no, I'm just playing. Oh, no. Song is coming later, okay? We're going we still trying to get our little steps together. We're going to come up with something. <laughs> All right. I don't know, I don't know why the Lord uh, is leading me to, leading us to go down this route. But today, and I don't know how long it's going to be, uh, for, you know, that we'll be on this subject in this family broadcast, but today we're going to talk about sibling rivalry. And I don't, and I'm guessing it's, it's for a reason, and it's, it's, you know, I believe that we'll learn uh, several uh, principles concerning civil, uh, sibling rivalry. Sibling rivalry. And uh, so we're going to go over. And I remember when the Lord began to deal with me with this about a week and a half ago. And, uh, of course, you know, when, a lot of times the Lord will speak something to me. And, and my response is always, I need to see it in Scripture. I, you, you know, I don't want to just get up and talk from w w the top of my head or anything like that. Show me in the Scripture, you know, and show me the principles that, that we're going to go over in Scripture so that I... Uh, you know, I believe in having the word to, to back it up. And so, if you have your Bibles, let's go to the fourth chapter of the book of Genesis. Fourth chapter of the book of Genesis. <clears throat> and I'm aware that there are adults that are sitting here and may be listening in and may even be watching us on television. And so, you may say, well, you know, I'm grown. I'm not in s sibling rivalry. You know, we're not competing. Uh, except <laughs> there are some grown people who are still competing. And, and so, and, and we have to look at it this way as well. If you have that inside of you, it, it, it's not just between you and your siblings. And I believe that this is where uh, God will hit home with a lot of us that will be listening to this message. You know, if you have a, a spirit of competitiveness, competitiveness uh, really now we're just going to call it what it is it's a spirit of strife then this is a message for you you see sibling rivalry and oftentimes it start with the siblings because those are the first people you're getting to know though that they are your first friends so to speak they're your first playmates and things like that and then you you, you grow up and it and you know <clears throat> I've seen it real bad you know, and, and I've been told about it among women. I didn't know until I got quite older. You know, I guess I just wasn't paying attention that that especially women, uh, females can be very, very um, competitive. I guess, for lack of a better term, among one another, uh, jealousy and, and things like that. You know, and these things God wants to address. You see. Uh, the Bible says that when we have strife and envy on the inside of us, that we won't inherit the kingdom of God, you see. And so if I have a spirit of competitive, competitiveness, in other words, a spirit of strife, strife isn't us balling up our fists and going at one another. That's just a part of it. Strife is, hmm, look, I see what you got on. You know, you think you all that, or you think you something, or, you know, Look at you with your nice clothes. Can nobody tell that? Now that's strife. I don't have a, I, you know, you can see somebody never say anything to them, but just have those thoughts. Those thoughts of comparing yourself to them, or you know, thinking that they're thinking a certain way. That's strife. And according to the word of God, we won't inherit the kingdom of heaven. We won't inherit the kingdom of God when we have that on the inside of us. 
You see, and so God wants to address that tonight. Hey Amen. I'm just going to make this point that, you know, what you said about women, and I think probably the women in here will agree with that, that um, women are like that where, you know, um, at some stage, you know, in our life have that competitiveness about, you know, it, and usually it, it has everything to do with the physical appearance. Um, that's usually where it starts. But um, I, I can speak for myself that, you know, when I dealt, when I dealt with that, it had more to do with my insecurities and less to do with the other people um, who I might have been seeing or, and, and so that's something that we have to, um, I guess we have to look at as women or, you know, men, if they deal with that, I don't know. Um, you know, what is it about myself that I don't like that causes me to, you know, look at somebody else in that manner or, you know, to even have that, um, that strife or whatever in, in me, you know, yeah. towards another person. Yeah, and, and I believe that that's the case in, in every case. I think when there's a spirit of strife, it's not really based on who the target is. Mm -hmm. It's based on what's coming from the inside of me. So if I'm insecure in who I am, then the only way I know how to uh, make myself feel good is by putting down people who I deem to be more than I am, mm -hmm. you know. And, and, and uh, it's, that's not God's will. That's strife. And oftentimes, we'll, if we're not careful, we, we will misread people. You know, somebody might dress nice, but that's just them. Has nothing to do with, you know, them thinking that they're better than you. They might not even know you exist. <laughs> but you'll be up, you know, just angry at a person. You know, people, now the devil is a, a master at what he does. You'll have attitude towards people who don't even know that you're around or who may not even be aware that you have things on on the inside of you towards them mm -hmm. you see and so uh we, we have to be careful with these things that we don't allow the enemy to sneak stuff in and you know and, and we have to do a, a, a check of ourselves when it comes to that in that area there that area of strife and that that robbery and, and things like that god's not pleased with that you see mm -hmm. and i honestly believe that if we know who we are in god in fact, let's start reading in the fourth chapter of the book of Genesis. And uh, we're going to start reading at verse 1. And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. Now, one of them was, uh, both of them were, I guess you can say, farmers. One of them did gardens. The other one did animals. You got two two different people there, two different types of things that they did, and and one could not compare to the other. Now I want you to see this. One of them had animals, and, and one of them had had the ground to till. Mm -hmm. You see. Now in reality, when you look at the cycle of life, both of them needed one another. You see. One of them, the, the one with the animals, needed the grass, his animals, to eat grass. And the one with the, 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 um, the and to eat the food, of course, of, the, of the, what was, what was um, planted, you see. And the other one, he needed f fertilization, which would come from the animals, eating. Everybody understand? So God had a way of, of bringing it full circle in that family where both of those brothers needed one another. Mm -hmm. And I want you to notice what Eve said about Cain. I have gotten a man from the Lord. She didn't say that as far as we know about Abel. Yeah, not, let's keep that in, in mind. Let's go ahead and keep reading. And in process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. Why didn't he have respect of Cain and his offering? 
According to the word of God, the difference between those two brothers was one of them did it by faith. You see, Abel brought his offering to the Lord by faith. Okay, go ahead, let's go ahead and keep reading. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. Now, wait a second. I, I want us to really pay attention to this. The Bible says that Cain was angry, was upset, you see. Why? Because God had respect of, of Abel's offering and didn't have respect of his. Was it that God was partial towards one and, and, and not towards the other? Let's go ahead and keep reading. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy, thou countenance fallen? And thou doest well, if thou doest well, shall thou not be accepted? Everybody see that? Now God comes and have this conversation, a special conversation with Cain. Why are you angry? Now, now, that's a loving father, you see. He comes to him. He could have just said, look, you got your latitude. too. You can go on, you know. It's just going to be that way until you get it together. I'm not going to say anything. You know what's going on, you know. But God said, came to him and told, asked him, why are you angry? What did, what did he say? Why are you angry? Why is thou countenance fallen? In other words, why are you walking around like it's the end of the world? If thou doest well, shall thou not be accepted? So what God is doing, he's taking the attention off of Cain as far as you, you're picking my brother over me. And he's saying, don't look at your brother, Cain. This is about me and you. I'm the one that, you know, that, that have not accepted what you're doing. And it's not because I like one of you better than the other one. It's because you're not doing well. Well, what was he doing? Let's go ahead and keep reading. And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. That's talking about sin. Now, the, the only difference, and let me say this again, and then we'll tie this in together. The difference between Cain and Abel was Abel brought his offering by faith. The Bible says that righteousness is by faith. So Abel's offering, his sacrifice, was righteous. In other words, the way that he was living was righteous. Now, let me explain what this is in, in natural terms today. Cain, uh, Abel is the one that goes to church, he sing, he sing praises to God, and he goes home and he lives a life that backs up what he hears in this word. By faith, he does that. It's not just him going to church. Now, now Cain was the one that went to church, gave his offering, did his religious duty, went home and lived a completely separate life didn't live for God at all outside of those four walls. Does everybody see? And so Abel was the one who, who lived what he talked about. He wasn't just a religious man. This was a part of life for him. And so God comes to Cain and says, Now, why are you upset? If you, don't you know if you do well, I'll accept you? In other words, you bringing me offering, Cain, is not enough to appease me. You got to do more than that. The Bible tells us in the 12th chapter of the book of Romans that we are to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service. It's not enough to come put your money in the offering plate and think, well, this is going to buy me some more time with God. Or this is going to give me favor with God. God didn't accept it. At the beginning of time, and he's not accepting it now. Don't matter how much money you think you you giving him, he he doesn't need your money. Because he didn't die for money, he died for your soul. You see that, and so here God is bringing this out very plainly to Cain, 
Okay, this is not about your brother and you. This is not the relationship between you and your brother. This, this is about me and your relationship. I have not accepted your offering because you're not doing well. Because you're living in sin, Cain. All right, let's go ahead and keep reading. And Cain talked with Abel, his brother. And it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel, thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? You see that? Now right there we see the heart of Cain. He killed his brother. But really because he was jealous and envious of the relationship that Abel had with God. But the real problem was him. Cain was a compromiser. Now let me tell you what's at the root of the hearts of compromisers. Compromisers don't want to be around anybody that's not compromising. How many of us have known people who, who may know that we are living, or may know that you are living a righteous life, but they will come and try to befriend you and the whole time trying to pull you back in the world, and, and they will do it with questions. I, I knew somebody uh, who was supposed to be a preacher, and may have been. God may have really called him. I don't know. That's between him and the Lord. And I, I, I went over to his house one day uh, to take care of some business, and while I was sitting there, just, you know, I wasn't thinking about anything. Just out of the blue, he says, yeah, I smoke a little weed. <laughs> but, you know, what you going to do about it? You can't judge me. Now, I wasn't sitting there thinking about weed. I didn't smell it. I, I, you know, never saw him smoke it. I wouldn't have known that unless he, if he hadn't said anything, unless the Lord had revealed it to me. But yeah, but yeah, I smoke a little weed. You know what? You know, don't you, you know, everybody got their vices. Everybody got... And I was thinking, Lord, it must be you convicted him. Because I promise you, you know. <laughs> but see, what it was, it was a door that the enemy was trying to open. Like, oh yeah, that's okay, brother. I'm a fornicator. We cool. You know, we, you know grace covers it. <laughs> you see? And so compromise, it introduces sin, you know, and, and the devil, devil is very, very subtle with it. And before you know it, you know, you, you'll be the people that you're hanging around, you see, before you know it. And, and so what was this thing that caused Cain to kill Abel? It was the fact that Abel was righteous. And whenever light is around darkness, Light always exposes darkness. And that's what Cain didn't like. You see that? And so here, we see in this fourth chapter, the first time murder have taken place in this earth, as far as we know, uh, between two brothers. Now, I want you to notice uh, the character of sin and, and what, what took place here. That in the first generation, Adam and Eve... They disobeyed God and ate something that they weren't supposed to eat. The very next generation, the devil introduced murder into this world. It shows you that slope of sin. Today, you drinking a little liquor. Tomorrow, the devil will have you hooked on drugs. Does everybody see? It's a slope. When the devil gets you at the top of that slide, it's not for you to just sit there. He's going to push you down that slide. You see that? And, and so that's one of the things that we, that we better know, you see. And so here we see this sibling rivalry going on. What was at the root of it? Cain felt little because he himself was not righteous. And whenever somebody is looking across the road and, and criticizing the righteousness of others and competing with others, it's not because it, it has absolutely nothing to do well, what that other person has going on. Somebody that's securing themselves, they don't have to do that. 
Uh, now, going back to verse 1, what did Eve say about Cain? I have gotten a man from the Lord. So what was Cain's problem? If he really knew who he was in the Lord, this wouldn't have taken place. When people know who they are in God, now, we're bringing this out spiritually. Now, we can sit here all night and talk about how, how folks petty with one another, you know, going tit for tat with one another about, you know, little petty things like looks and clothes and material possessions and, and, and everything. But when it all boils down to it, you can trace it right back here to the fourth chapter of the book of Genesis. There is a spiritual problem that's going on. Does everybody see? I, I can be the poorest person in the world living in a tent somewhere in the middle of a field. If I have God, I, I'm content with whatever it is that God has allotted for me. I don't have to live in a big house. I don't have to drive the nicest car. I just want a relationship with God and he sustains the rest of it. He, he you know, I'm more concerned with who I am in him, not how you see me. Now, talking as a believer and as a Christian, see, when you know who you are in God and your relationship with God, you're, you're not concerned with who, who's doing what or, you know, what they have on or what possessions they may have and all of these things. You're not concerned with that. Because you understand, if I have a relationship with God, I'll get whatever's coming to me. And if God choose to make me prosperous, Financially or, you know, material wise, that's fine. Either way, I'm okay as long as he's in my life. But when you don't have the relationship with God that you're supposed to have, it's not about spiritual things anymore. It's about natural things. You begin to measure yourself by what you have, by your material possessions. And oftentimes, of course, we use that term, you know, keeping up with the Joneses. Oftentimes, you know, we can get in trouble looking at um, when things come. As a matter of fact, this kind of came up in the conversation we were having with the kids earlier. You know, wherever you are in life, you know, you may be just starting out um, financially and trying to get stability, but you look at somebody who's been practicing, you know, um, financial principles or whatever for 20, 30, 40 years, they're going to be in a better position. But oftentimes what happens is people will look at somebody who's got 20, 40 years experience on them and they're trying to get to where that person is right now. And the same is true spiritually. So when we're talking about somebody can see how the Lord is using somebody in a certain way or, you know, see the Lord blessing them and instead of them just Seeking, seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and allowing the Lord to add things to them, they're looking at other people and thinking, oh, well, I want what they have, or I want to do what they're doing, and I want the Lord to use me like that. But that might not even be how the Lord wants to use you. You know, and I think the proper thing to do is not to try to rush just so you can get the benefits right away, but just take your time and get to know the Lord and let him work out in your life whatever it is he want to work out and add to it whatever he want to add to it. Amen. The, the Bible tells us that the blessings of the Lord adds no sorrow. That's right. That means that when God bless you with something, you're going to be mature enough to handle it. Amen. Oftentimes people see the fruit of people's maturity. And they think, I can handle it. I, I, I want that. Except you can't. Hmm. I'll give you some examples. You, you just go Google um, um, some of those people that have won the lottery mm -hmm. years ago and see where they are financially. Mm -hmm. Prime example. A lot of people just can't handle it. And they get all of that money at one time and don't know what to do with it. Just go out and spend it all and, and, and just do the same thing they're doing with the three pennies that they had before they won the lottery. Does everybody see? 
So uh, uh, unless something changes, unless you mature, mm -hmm. that's the reason, and we'll say this, that's the reason why we have so many stars today who are going crazy, putting thousands of dollars worth of platinum in their mouth. For what? Does everybody see? Going out and buying five and six cars and can't drive but one of them at a time. Why? It's because it, that's what's on the inside of people. And they think that that's, you know, the life. And then they end up going bankrupt, you know, because, the, you know, and this may surprise some of us. I, I read somewhere where the average NFL career is only five years. The average NFL career is five years. And so what happens is people get used to living a certain lifestyle and then when their career go down the drain, you know, uh, they have to retire, whatever the case may be, they can't continue it. Why? Because they were not mature enough. You think about it. You're giving 20-year-old 20, 20 people, 25-year-old uh, kids, millions of dollars with no character to back it up. Hmm. What do you think is going to happen? You see that? And so oftentimes, this, these are the types of things that brings about the, the envy and the jealousy and the strife. The devil got all kind of people compete with one another. You see? Who says that because I'm a millionaire, I need to go and buy the biggest house I can find? You can't sleep but in one room at a time. There's nobody there but you and, and your, your wife. Do you need that? Does everybody see? I've known millionaires who you would never know was a millionaire. They drive regular cars. So you, you just never know that they had millions of dollars in the bank because they not, they're not trying to impress anybody. You see? They, they are secure in who they are. But if you're not secure in who you are, you're going to do the outward show. I'm big bad, but I'm big and bad because I've bought the latest bins. And so your worth becomes what you can buy and, and flaunt it, you see. Mm -hmm. And so that's not God's will. And so it, but it all boils down to people knowing who they are in God and not getting caught up in this so much, you see. And, and so that's what God wants us to understand about this, the spirit of strife is that it, it comes from the enemy and, and he sets people against one another for no reason. You have gang wars going on over turf, uh, whole gangs killing one another over land they don't even own. Hmm. Well, they might walk the streets. They don't own any of it. It's the spirit of strife. It's the same thing that happens in churches today where people go into church and they want certain positions and, and they get jealous of one another because maybe the Lord is using this one this way and another one that way, you see, it's strife. And so it, it starts between siblings a lot of times if it's there and, and then you grow up and you take it to church, you take it to work with you. You see, it's not just between siblings, it's if you have it, you're having it, it's going to be with whoever that is in your circle. Mm -hmm. Amen. <laughs> Amen. And so let's let's learn this tonight. We're gonna we're not going to uh finish this tonight, this this sibling rivalry that, that's going on or that was going on here. Uh, we're gonna cover uh other areas of it, of this sibling rivalry, not just with Cain and Abel, but with some more people in the Word of God that we find and my prayer is that we'll, that we'll continue to learn the things that God would have us to learn concerning this. The root of it is strife. And God wants you to know who you are in Him. And, and let me say this, you know, when it comes to siblings, I believe if you have brothers and sisters, you know, you should know. Now, let me speak spiritually first. God has enough love to go around to to everybody. He's not, you know, 100% love 
and then he has to give you 50% and then give somebody else 30% and the rest of y'all will divide that 20% somewhere. He has enough love to go around. So in other words, you don't have to compete for it. Does everybody see? You don't have to compete for God's love. You see? And you don't have to p compete for the position that he has for you. He made you exactly what he wanted to make you. And your job is to accept what it is that God has made you. Whatever talent, whatever gift he has given you, he's given you that for his glory. Now the problem, a lot of times when it comes to sibling rivalry and, and, and strife among people, is people don't understand, God give me this for his sake. He's given me this for me to glorify him. But what happens when we, when we take it and, and we're corner minded, we think it's for us. And that's where the rivalry comes in at. That's where the strife comes in at. It's when we're putting flesh in what God intended to be spiritual to begin with. Amen. I just want to share this last um, scripture concerning, concerning these two brothers that we read about. Um, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, it says, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And I just want to say this, because this is the one thing that just sticks out to me about that, that we have to walk by faith. Everything we do for the Lord, we have to do it by faith. Um, because the scripture plainly says that it's impossible to please him without faith. And so... Um, don't allow the enemy to have you looking at other people that you that may be in the vicinity of whether wherever you are, whether it's church, home, work, or school, whatever it may be. Um, but this is to me um, the time for us to examine ourselves and our faith walk and where we are with the Lord. I mean that that's what it was all about. Um, one person might be offering their life, you know, in faith. They might be offering their praise and. Whatever it is they're doing, and the next person may just be doing it out of routine. But the question is not whether I can look at somebody and determine where they are, but where am I? You know, this word is how we measure ourselves. You know, we have to ask ourselves, why is it that I do what I do? You know, why, why do I take the time to talk to the Lord? Is it only because I want to reap the benefits of what I've heard he can do for me? Why do I tell somebody else about the Lord? Is it because I want them to think that I'm a Christian and it's really to put myself out there and not really the Lord? Why is it that I carry a Bible or I do whatever it is I do? Why do I sing? Do I, am I doing these things really for the Lord or is it about me? What is my attitude toward the Lord? And, and that's what I really want us to take away from this tonight, you know, this first part, part one of this, you know, series. You know, where am I in my faith walk? Am I doing the things that I'm doing in faith? Even though you might be able to recognize some things that you've done wrong in your past and some sin and some faults and things that may be there, do I accept the Lord's word by faith that, he has clothed me in his righteousness that, you know, I am the righteousness of Christ that I can live without sin. Because if I accept that, then I'll start to walk towards that. If I accept that the Lord can heal, then I'll start to walk towards that. If I have faith that he can deliver and that he is a protector and that he is a provider, then that's what I'll walk towards. So then the question is, you know, are we just going through routine? Are we just doing what we think we're supposed to do to get the blessings of God? Or are we really walking by faith and trusting God that he is who he say he is? And even though it may not be playing out the way I want it to play out, I know in the end God's word is not going to return, return to him. Both. You know, and that's the question for us, for us to examine ourselves before the Lord and examine ourselves with the word tonight. Where are we in our faith walk? Where are we in our faith walk? Amen. Amen.